You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. Uh, our scripture today, as we look at love and action, is really threefold. First of all, uh, we look at a little passage in Romans chapter 12, um, verse 9a. So this is not the whole verse. This is Romans chapter 12, verse 9a, and it's simply these words, let love be genuine, okay? And then we move to Romans, excuse me, that was Romans 12a. Then <laughs> we move to uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 22. So James verse chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then finally, from the little book of 1 John chapter 3, uh, uh, beginning with verse 16. So 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 16, running through verse 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let not your love be in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. This ends the reading from God's holy word. Let's pray together before we have our message. <clears throat> Dear Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In theological seminaries, in Master of Divinity programs, there's always a course called homiletics. In order to get your MDiv, you must take this class called homiletics. And homiletics has to do with the art of preaching. Now, in homiletics class, you learn that there are many different forms of preaching. One form is called expository preaching. Expository preaching is, is preaching where you take a passage of Scripture and you just go verse by verse, maybe phrase by phrase, and you seek to exegete or extract the meaning of that passage or of those verses. Now, normally when I preach, I, I preach more thematically, uh, topically, and uh, parabolically, but this morning, this morning I want to do a little bit of of kind of an expository kind of thing. I want us to take a look at, at three little passages and I want us to exegete them. I want us to try to extract the meaning, okay, on this Love and Action Sunday. So we're gonna take these three passages that I just gave you as scripture and we're gonna seek to extract the meaning. So first of all, Romans 12, uh, verse 9a. Romans 12, 9a, let love be genuine. Now, this word genuine, what does that mean? What does it mean to say, I want my love to be genuine? Now, for hundreds of years, for hundreds of years, the only Bible used in the Christian churches was the Latin Vulgate Bible. The, the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament were rendered into Roman, they were rendered into Latin, and so throughout all the churches, particularly in Europe, the Latin Vulgate Bible, hundreds of years. Now in this verse, Romans 12, 9a, the word genuine is rendered by the Roman word, by the Latin word, sincere. Sincere is the word from which we get our English word, sincere, okay? So let love be sincere. But sincere literally means without wax. Let your love be without wax. Now understand, in the Roman world, people made things. They made some things out of wood, 
They made other things out of marble or stone. And they would give these things as gifts or they would purchase them for themselves and place them in their home. Items made of wood, items made of marble. Sometimes the marble or the wood would crack. Sometimes the marble or the wood would chip and they would fill it in with wax. They'd fill the cracks in with wax. They'd fill the chips in with wax. Literally, sincerai means without decay or without um, corruption. It means whole. But it came to mean without wax because these items of wood and of marble, when they were cracked or chipped, were filled in with wax. And they were, sincere, they were not sincere. They were not without wax. So basically, the implication here is, is that our love is full of wax. Our love is cracked. Our love is chipped. Our love is not whole, but we have this goal set before us that our love would be whole, that our love would be without cracks, that it'd be without chips, that it would be without wax. This is the goal. Now, we can look at our love, any kind of love, and we see the wax. You can look at eros love. Eros love is the Greek word for romantic love. Uh, I know this is hard to believe uh, for some of you who are younger, I'm 64 years old, and I can remember my teenage years. You might think, oh, you get into your 60s, and you can't even remember your teenage years, but you can. I can remember my teenage years. I can remember when I was a teenager, uh, I had a girlfriend. I had a girlfriend. We kind of went together on and off for a year and a half. And I thought she was kind of cute, and I, and I thought she was uh, deep in her faith, and very spiritual, and I respected that. Certainly, she was a more committed Christian than I was at that time in my life. And we went together for a year and a half, and, and we would, uh, you know, I took her to the senior prom, et cetera, and, and we wrote each other notes, and she would always say, uh, I love you greatly, I'll love you forever, and I would say similar things to her. She went away to Guatemala where her parents were missionaries between my senior year of high school and my first year of college. And, uh, you know, she wrote me pretty regularly and, and I just kind of wasn't into that. And I didn't write her back and I think she decided my love was full of wax. And she came back and told me she didn't love me anymore and I decided her love was full of wax. And I think this is the kind of a teenage deal oftentimes, you know? A lot of love that's full of wax. Got a lot of cracks, got a lot of chips, a lot of holes. Um, and yet it can still hurt. I mean, you're still involved and, and it can still hurt. Now you grow up. You, you grow up and, and you, really, you really fall in love. And many people, most people get married and, and, and you get married, but even married love has cracks in it and chips in it, and wax. And some of you have experienced incredible pain because you've had your husband or your wife, your spouse, say to you, I don't love you anymore, and I don't think I ever did. I mean, that is the pain of life, and through my years in the ministry, many years of counseling, and I've talked to so many couples in the midst of many tears, describing that pain of experiencing a love that is full of wax. Uh, this is the world in which we live, eros love. Now, there's family love, storgeo love, and it's also sometimes filled with wax. Now, for our family, this has been a huge week. Uh, our daughter, Heather, and her husband, Chris, have had their third-born child, a, a little son. The two girls that... Um, they've had are named Abigail and Nina, and this little boy uh, they named Dixon. So it's Abigail Low, Nina Low, and now Dixon Low. And of course, I kind of like the name Dixon. <laughs> now, you know, it was a hard birth for Heather over at Sky Ridge Hospital. And, uh, you know, she was. Uh, given an epidural, and as sometimes happens, in about one out of every 100 cases, it just doesn't take. And, and so she had a great deal of pain, even though she has a wonderful pediatrician and uh, uh, an incredible doctor. Uh, 
who delivered the baby, um, Jack Hevron, who's a member of this church and a great friend. And, and Jack gave her another uh, uh, block to help her with the pain. But still, she was in a lot of pain. And the baby, little Dixon, was huge. I mean, even though, you know, he was taken early, almost two weeks early, still nine pounds, one ounce, this baby would have been 10 pounds. And Heather's small, and she's very small-boned, and this was just a hard, hard delivery and very, very painful, but there's that storgeo, that family love that's already there. And Heather would have died for that baby. I mean, that's the kind of love that is there. And of course, uh, you know, three nights in the hospital, because it was hard, and Barb and I had the other uh, granddaughters. We, we had Nina and Abigail and had them for three days. But then after the birth, uh, Heather and Chris and and Dixon had to go back to the hospital, spend another night because they thought there were some neurological uh, irregularities in Dixon. So, uh, you know, they ran tests and MRI and EEGs, uh, and, and things are looking pretty good. We took the girls again at home. Uh, Nina got sick, threw up all night. Uh, you know, we thought maybe she was better the next morning. She was kind of doing pretty good. We went over to Starbucks, and she threw up right there at Starbucks, and we kind of cleaned it up, said thank you very much, and we're out of here, and, uh, but it's called, it's really called family love. That's called family love, that's storgeo, you know. But see, even family love has holes in it, cracks in it, a lot of wax. There's deadbeat dads out there. There's some deadbeat moms out there. There's children who, who grow up and don't even care about their aging parents. Store gay old love, but it's got a lot of wax. This is the human predicament. Of course, there's phileo love. This is friendship love. And it too can be filled with wax. I have a, I'm blessed with many friends. And some of you are, uh, are good friends, and I've gotten over the years, I've grown over the years to know and love you. Uh, and I, yet I, I know that sometimes in my friendships, um, I feel like uh, I disappoint. I disappoint uh, people. Barbara said to me before that the ministry is just a call to disappoint people. And, and, and it does kind of feel that way, because you can't please everybody. You just can't please, it would not be physically possible and, and I made this decision some years ago to never do anything on a Saturday night. It, for me, it's sacrosanct. It is set apart for God. I, I can't do Sunday mornings unless I get away and, and don't do anything on Saturday night. But I get invitations. I mean, any other night is, is, you know, as open, it's available. But Saturday nights are sacrosanct. And I felt before God I needed to do this. But I have great friends and they're doing things on Saturday night. And they want Barb and I to be there. They have a very special occasion. It's Saturday night. It's a special occasion. It's a huge birthday. It's a huge this. It's a huge that. And, and I say no. I say no. And I know that, oh, I think that feels like, wow, Jim, Jim's friendship love has a lot of wax. You know? And it, it does because uh, I'm like you. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm very cracked very flawed. Uh, but I think we're all in a, in a process of learning how to be friends, aren't we? And what, what it means to be, you know, a good friend. Uh, but we're in this human predicament. Now, the word that's used in this verse in Romans 9a, let love be genuine, let love be sincere, let love be without wax, the word is agape. It's not eros, it's not storgeo, it's not phileo, it's agape. And agape is a word captured from the Hellenized world in the Bible and given special meaning. And in the Bible, agape means Christian love. It means love that is like God's love. Agape means love that is selfless, love uh, that's unconditional. So agape, this is, let it be genuine. Let it be without wax. And oh, isn't that hard? I mean, to have the love of Jesus in us, to let people, let the love of Jesus shine through us and be without wax. Uh, 
In fact, the actual Greek word in Romans um, 9a is aupokritis. Aupokritis, and a means with, without, and upokritis is the word from which we get hypocrisy. So without hypocrisy. Let your agape love be without hypocrisy. And I think for me that means that at least if I'm not going to love exactly as Jesus loves, I ought to admit it. Okay? So I admit that this morning. I'm trying to love like Jesus loves, but I'm not there yet. I don't want to be a hypocrite and pretend I do love like Jesus loves. Every once in a while, his love shines through me. And I am so grateful for his mercy. But I'm a project, and I'm in process, and so are you. But let your love be genuine. That's the goal. Let your love be genuine. Now, there's a second verse, James 1.22. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word. Now, in the Bible, the word means three things. First of all, the word means the Bible itself. This is the word. This book is called the word. And it's the word of God. Holy Scripture. Now, the word is under attack today. The Bible. Under attack today. There's a battle for the Bible. I received... Uh, about a week ago, a letter from, from another pastor. It's a very, very nice letter, very thoughtful. And this pastor also sent me a book. And the book was uh, a book by Brian McLaren called A New Type, A New Kind of Christianity. Uh, and and uh, Brian McLaren had written me a note in the front of the book. Um, and it was very nice, a very uh, complimentary, very kind. Uh, Brian McLaren does not know me, and, and I do not know Brian McLaren. I have read some of his books, and I have heard him speak. Um, I have a problem with the books and with the teaching of Brian McLaren. Brian McLaren is part of a group that is sometimes called the Emerging Church, it's relatively small when you look at the whole church world, the whole Christian world, but it's a group called the Emerging Church, and, and it's hard to stereotype because there's great variety within the Emerging Church, but Brian McLaren is, is kind of part of this movement, and, and my problem is, is that a lot of the literature in this movement um, is, in my view, uh, borderline heresy and touching uh, apostasy. And as a pastor... And as one who really believes that we're moving towards the end of days, when there'll be this growth of apostasy, I'm very concerned. I'm very alarmed. Now, in this movement, you have this teaching that the Bible is not fully credible. This is what's taught by many parts of the emerging church. The Bible is not fully credible. It's not completely valid. You can't completely trust it because it's influenced by Greco-Roman culture and other ancient Semitic cultures that were tribal and violent. So as you read the Bible, you get a view of God that is tribal and you get a view of God that is violent. So fortunately, they say, in the Bible there's evolution. So as you move through the Bible, there's this evolution in the Bible's view of God, and it gets a little bit better as it moves ultimately to Jesus. But you have this tribal, violent view of God. So when you see the story of Noah you, you, and the destruction of the world by flood, God would never do this. God never did do this. That's just tribal and violent. When you read the story of Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea and how God spared his tribe, how God spared his people, how God spared his remnant, but how the children of Israel were completely drowned. God would never do that and God didn't do that, they argue. That's just the 
Greco-Roman or Semitic tribal violent God. And so they would argue that in the Bible, you have this stream of revelation. There's a stream of revelation that moves from Genesis to Revelation. And much in the Bible is not in the stream. There's a stream of revelation, but you have to go through the Bible and find out what's in that stream and what's outside of the stream, what's true and what's not true, what has authority and what does not have authority. And so in this emerging church movement, that they, they say, well, this, this, this is true, this is not true. This is in the stream, this is not in the stream. And they can thereby uh, change Judeo-Christian morality, change Judeo-Christian theology because they have the right to judge what's right and what's not right in the Bible. And in this emerging church movement, uh, because of this view of the nonviolence of God, the cross is even rejected because the cross is violent. God would never do that. And so the heart of the gospel is lost because God would not have wanted his son to suffer. And substitutionary atonement, the very heart of the gospel, is lost. Uh, now, there's much more I could say. Much more I could say, and I, and I feel like as a pastor, I need to warn you about books like this. I mean, I want to be nice to people. I'm sure Brian McLaren is a great guy. Yeah, I don't know him, but I bet he's a great guy. I just feel, though, I need to warn you about this type of literature and the times in which we are living. And... I'll tell you one thing, though, that I would say Brian McLaren is right about, and that is that the Bible is all about love. He's right about that because Jesus said that. The Torah is all about love. It's all about the Shema. It's Leviticus 19, 18. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, love, love. That's true. Of course, you can't throw parts of the Bible out and fully understand the love of God, what it means to love God and what it means to love each other. You can't throw parts of the Bible out. The Old Testament, I hope you understand, means Old Covenant. The New Testament means New Covenant. And so the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, describes all the terms of the Old Covenant that God made with Israel, with Abraham and Moses. And then the New Testament is the New Covenant describing the terms of that New Covenant which God made with the nations through Jesus. You can't throw any of it out or you destroy all, you, you, you don't, receive the full covenant. But it is about love. And it is true. Love is something you do. It's something you feel. It's something you believe, but it's also something you do. And so be doers of the word, you know, means there's a sense in which you got to do this book. You got to do this book. See, I know people who are orthodox theologically and morally. They can recite the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. They bend the knee at the Westminster Confession of Faith. They agree with all the ancient ecclesiastical councils. They understand Judeo-Christian values. They affirm them all. And they have an orthodox view of the Bible, but they don't do the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? That's scary. So it's scary when you don't believe the Bible, but it's also scary when you don't do the Bible. Be doers of the word. Of course, the word not only refers to the Bible. The word refers to Jesus. The Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God written. Jesus is the word of God living. He is the word of God living. And there's a sense in which, as followers of Jesus, we must do Jesus. I mean, it's not enough to believe the right things about him. Not enough to say, save me from my sin. If you really take him as Lord, you begin to do Jesus. That's a hard call. Now, in the ancient Roman world, in the ancient Roman world, there were many slaves. 
Uh, at the peak of the Roman Empire, some estimate there were as many as 50 million slaves in the Roman Empire. The entire Roman socioeconomic system was predicated on the existence of slavery. These slaves had varying roles in life, some demeaning, some more valued, but for all of them, their lives were not their own. They were property. Now, in this Roman world of slavery uh, came Christianity and the call of Jesus. And it's the call for us to serve the lowest of the low. There's a beautiful clip in a movie I, I want you to see. You've probably seen it, but maybe you've never really thought about it. It's a clip from one of the most awarded movies ever made. It's a clip from the movie, Ben-Hur. I'd like you to take a look at this.
The movie Ben-Hur was called, it is called, A Story of the Christ. The book was called A Story of the Christ. From the scene you just saw to the scene of Calvary, where his blood mingled with water and flows out to the world. I feel like it's one of the strongest, most beautiful, most powerful portrayals of Christ, though you do not see his face. But you understand to be doers of the word, and he is the word. You've got to lay down your life. You've got to do Jesus. You lay down your life. You give the cup of cold water. You wash feet. You do Jesus. You do the word. This is the agape love. This is his love. This is the love we're called to. And uh, it's the highest of calls. So be doers of the word. And the word is the word of God written. It's the word of God living. It's all the, also the word of God spoken. It's the gospel. Sometimes this this expression, the word, refers not to the Bible or to Jesus, but to the gospel. Be doers of the word means to respond to the gospel. It also means to go out into the nations and into the world and proclaim the gospel. Be doers of the word. And then it says something about deception in this passage. Deception. And, of course, the devil is the deceiver. And in the final stage of history, it will be a time of deception. And many will depart from the faith, and some will no longer endure sound teaching. So we, we know about the deception of the evil one. And the Bible tells us it's always with us, and it will be at its peak as we approach the end. But sometimes we deceive ourselves. And so this passage of Scripture says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So, so you see, as Christians, we deceive ourselves when we think that we can believe the Bible as authority, authoritative, believe properly about Jesus, you know, believe in the Great Commission and the gospel, but not do anything. That's self-deception. Be doers of the word. So that's our second passage. And then finally, 1 John 3, uh, 16 through 18. I want to take a brief look at this. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us. And so we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let not your love be in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. So, some people have the goods, and some people have the need. That's what this passage says. Now, the word for goods is bios. You might think it would be agathos, or another word like kalos, but no. It's bios, and bios means life. It's the word from which we get biology. If anyone has bios, but it means everything needed for life. In this form that it's in, in this passage, bios means everything needed for life. It means livelihood. If you have the means of physical provision, bios, and you see... You are brother in need, crea, distress, destitute, or really in need of anything. And you close your heart against him. How does God's love abide in you? That's a tough passage of scripture in many ways. First of all, we live in Douglas County and we have the goods. Uh, you, all you do is take a look at National census reports. Um, this is one of the 10 most educated counties in the United States of America and one of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States of America. And you might be sitting there thinking, wow, what happened to me? But as the world views things, as God views things, we have the goods. 
So, so this passage is hard for us. We have the goods. And there's lots of needs out there. And obviously you can't meet them all, and God understands that. I mean, Jesus, you know, went to uh, the pool of Bezatha in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, sometimes called in some early manuscripts Bethesda, in other early manuscripts Bethsaida, but in most Bezatha. And so he went to that pool with five porticos, and there was a great multitude of infirmed, sick, paralyzed, ill, lame, right? The need was great, and Jesus had the goods. And there was a man there who had been paralyzed for 38 years. And Jesus, because he had the goods, healed him. Rise, take up your pallet, and walk. But he only healed him. <laughs> Have you thought about that? At the pool of Bethsatha, there was a multitude of people. They all had the need, and he had the goods. And so I hope you understand when you look at the Bible holistically, what you must do, that this doesn't mean that every need must be met by you. Or pretty soon, you wouldn't have the goods. You'd just be the person with the need. You understand what I'm saying? So there has to be a combination of the goods and the need and the call. So you need spiritual discernment here. But you also need a mindset, a mindset that is constantly saying, who can I help? A mindset that's constantly saying, how can I help? A mindset that, that is looking by the call of Christ to give yourself away. This must be your mindset. If love uh, is genuine in you, is genuine in me. If you see your brother in need, the word Adelphos there can mean brother or sister. It, it can be a generic word. Many passages of the Bible, you have to look at the context to know that. But in this case, it's brother or sister. It's generic. And it can mean Christian or it can mean non-Christian because the word Adelphos is used in both ways in the Bible. So, you know, you could take this to mean you see a Christian in need, but but you could also take this to mean anyone in need because this word Adelphos has that scope. And, and you close your heart against him. We cannot close our heart. So he says, let your love be not in word or in speech, but in deed and in truth. Now this, this Greek word for speech, a lot of people love with their speech, but not with their, with their deeds. The word for speech is glossa. We get glossary from this word glossa. The word glossolalia comes from this word glossa. It means literally tongue. Um, and you know that passage in James chapter 3, starting with verse 1, about the tongue. This passage kind of takes it a step further. James chapter 3 says, Let not many of you become teachers. And with this we'll close. Let not many of you become teachers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all make many mistakes. If anyone makes no mistakes in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. If we put bits in the mouths of horses that we may control them, we guide their whole bodies. Look also at the ships. Though they are so great and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue... The glossa is a little member which boasts of great things, how great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, an unrighteous world amongst our members, staining the whole body, staining the whole body setting on fire the cycle of nature, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no human being can tame 
the glossa. No human being can tame the tongue. A restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse man. We're made in his likeness and image. Brothers and sisters, it ought not to be so. Can a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and brackish? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you, by his good deeds, let him show forth his wisdom and the meekness of Christ. Now, we use our tongues, our glossa, to bless and curse. And I think most of us realize we need to bless more and curse less. We need to bless more and not curse at all. So every morning you should wake up and say, how can I use my tongue to bless? But you see, our passage here, the, the passage in 1 John 3 takes it a step far, further. It's not enough to use your tongue to bless. Don't just love in speech. You must love in deed. So it's not enough to reject cursing and just use your tongue for a blessing. You must take it a step further. You must put love into action. You must put your words, your speech, your gloss into action. You must love in deed. So here we are today. What an opportunity. I don't know what it is you're going to be doing today. Maybe you're part of the 2300 going into the community with the love of Christ and with servants' hearts. Maybe you're heading home today and you're not able to be part of that. But I hope uh, as you seek to be doers of the word and not hearers only, that uh, you want to be Jesus. You want to be his hands, his voice, uh, his feet. You want uh, to live out the word of God, the Bible. Uh, you want uh, to live out the gospel. You want to be that person that loves genuinely and not just in speech, but in deed. That's the call. And that's why we're doing what we're doing today. I think it's a big journey and it's a process that we're, we're in together and we're learning to love. That's part of what a church community is about. This is a place where we learn to love. So that's what we're doing today. We're learning to love. So, and it's agape love. It's Christian love. It's the love of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you uh, for this opportunity today. Thank you for each person here. Pray you'd bless them all. Thank you for those who are heading out into the community with us today. The 2,300, be with us. By your Holy Spirit, empower us. Let your love shine through us and give us servants' hearts for your kingdom's sake. In your great name we pray, amen.